Hey all, welcome back to the Real Life Pharmacology Podcast. I'm your host, pharmacist Eric Christensen. Thank you so much for listening today. As always, head over to reallifepharmacology.com. Uh, go check out your free top 200 study guides, a 31-page PDF. Uh, lots of little nuggets from uh, things that I've actually seen in the real world and clinical practice, uh, as well as things that often show up on board exams and pharmacology exams. So really great for anybody studying pharmacology or if you're looking for a refresher uh, and you've been out in clinical practice a little while too, um, a great little review uh, to kind of touch touch base and, and make sure you're, you're keeping up to speed with all the medications. So again, reallifepharmacology.com, go subscribe and you'll get that free 31-page PDF. All right, so let's get into the drug of the day today. And that is oxybutynin. Brand name of this medication is Ditropan. Uh, also, uh, there is a brand name uh, Oxytrol. And that is actually a patch formulation of uh, oxybutynin. Um, pretty much, I, I only see oxybutynin used for urinary symptoms. Um, on occasion, I, I've maybe seen it for... Um, you know, excessive salivation and a few kind of rare indications. But um, by and large, if you see oxybutynin, um, you can probably guess that it's going to be used for uh, overactive bladder, urinary kind of urgency, frequency, um, and, and symptoms of, of incontinence. Okay. So with that said, mechanistically, um, oxybutynin is, is classified as a urinary anticholinergic it blocks the action uh, of acetylcholine on urinary smooth muscle. And ultimately, this um, decreases urgency, um, it decreases uh, urinary frequency symptoms, uh, and also can uh, help with uh, bladder spasms. And, and I guess technically can be classified as an anti-spasmodic, uh, specifically uh, for the, the bladder there as well. Uh, dosing of this medication, um, immediate release, you know, daily doses in the range of, of 2.5. Uh, I've seen upwards of, of 20 milligrams max for the immediate release formulation. Um, extended release formulation, uh, there is a, a dosage form up to uh, 30 milligrams. So I, I have seen that on occasion as well. Um, extended release uh, product is, is typically given once a day. Uh, immediate release product is typically given uh, two to three times a day. Patch formulation, now that's a little bit interesting. I, it's been quite a while since I've, I've actually seen it used in practice, but uh, it's actually uh, changed out two times per week. Um, so in my mind, that's maybe kind of a, a downside where it's kind of a little bit of an odd schedule. You know, it's not once a week. Um, so it's it's changed every three to four days, and it is recommended to be consistent um, with that patch change. Again, not a, not a product I see used uh, very often, um, but I, I have seen it used a, a couple of times. Now, adverse effect profile. Uh, as you can imagine, oxybutynin being an anticholinergic, it's going to have anticholinergic adverse effects. And uh, in our geriatric patient population, this medication is on uh, the beers list. Uh, so n understanding, knowing those anticholinergic effects are absolutely critical. Uh, I think probably the easiest way I remember it is you can't spit, see, pee, or poop. So, you know, your dry mouth, uh, your vision issues, um, constipation, urinary retention, um, those are all potential uh, adverse effects. Uh, another one I, I do remember is, um, you know, many patients with diabetes can have gastroparesis, kind of kind of that slow gut movement, and anticholinergics can potentially worsen that. So it can exacerbate um, patients' uh, symptoms with gastroparesis. So, uh, you know, classic med, metoclopramide. So if I ever see a patient on metoclopramide, um, most of the time I see that medication, it's for gastroparesis. So if I see oxybutynin added on and I, I see this patient's on metoclopramide, I definitely start digging into diagnosis and saying, hey, you know, this is probably going to worsen their gastroparesis a little bit. So again, 
Uh, a lot of these adverse effects are dose dependent, and we think about that anticholinergic burden. Is this patient taking other anticholinergics as well that are kind of contributing, whether that be prescription or over the counter agents such as, you know, diphenhydramine that's in, you know, Advil PM and Tylenol PM? Uh, those are definitely things you, you got to look out for, for sure. Uh, so in addition to, to some of those adverse effects, um, confusion can certainly uh, happen. So adding on to, to patients' issues uh, that may have uh, dementia or memory issues already, uh, fall risk, and, and certainly sedation, um, lethargy can happen as well. Uh, rarely hyperthermia uh, may be an issue with anticholinergic meds like oxybutynin and hair. Um, so, you know, I'm more living more northern climates, so probably not too big of an issue that we worry about up here. Um, however, if you've got a patient that's, you know, traveling and you know they're traveling, um, you know, to, to a desert or, you know, really warm climate for the, the time of year that they're going, um, that might be something to, to give them a heads up to be really, really careful uh, that they may be a little bit more susceptible uh, to hyperthermia and elevated temperatures there. Um, also, I, I did want to mention um, meded101.com, the blog there, um, did do a recent uh, article on uh, drugs that cause hyperthermia. So if you just Google search that, drugs that cause hyperthermia, meded101, um, that should definitely uh, pop up for you in a search engine if you want to see uh, some other meds uh, in addition uh, to anticholinergics that may uh, cause hyperthermia. Great little article there to, to go check out and a few good refreshers there. Uh, a couple other things uh, about the patch that I did want to mention. So uh, from a practicality standpoint, the patch is generally going to be more expensive. So again, probably one of the big reasons why you don't see that compared to the, the dirt cheap uh, oral tablets there. Um, however, um, there is probably a, a lower incidence of uh, dry mouth and, and constipation. Now, keep in mind, can be dose dependent and that type of thing. Um, but using that patch formulation um, may cause a, a little bit less problems uh, with the uh, uh, GI tract there. All right, so let's take a quick break from our sponsor and we will wrap up with drug interactions. If you're in the market for pharmacist board certification study material like BCMTMS, BCPS, BCACP, BCGP, or the NAPLEX exam, definitely go check out meded101.com slash store. We've got links to all our content there, our study materials. Um, your support there directly helps keep this podcast free. Uh, in addition, if you're a nurse, a med student, uh, any other uh, medical student that has to uh, deal with and, and work with patients taking medications, uh, definitely go check out meded101.com slash store. We've got great uh, books on polypharmacy, case studies, drug interactions, all sorts of relevant clinical practice pearls um, that you can definitely benefit from and learn from for sure. A lot of them are taken directly uh, from my experience as a, a clinical pharmacist for 10 plus years. So uh, definitely go check out all those resources, meded101.com slash store. Um, like I said, purchases there help keep this podcast uh, free and educational for all to uh, benefit from. All right, so let's wrap up with drug interactions. First off, I always think of that anticholinergic burden. Um, you know, I, I kind of alluded to that before. So, uh, you know, tricyclic antidepressants, um, even like respiratory anticholinergics like ipatropium, teotropium, um, some of the older antihistamines, uh, you know, I think of uh, hydroxyzine, for example, there, diphenhydramine I mentioned before, um, cyclobenzaprine, another example of an older uh, skeletal muscle relaxant with some anticholinergic properties. So we, we got to remember that anticholinergic burden and obviously those adverse effects that I mentioned in the previous section uh, that go with that. Uh, CNS depressant effects, so additive effects there again as far as causing drug interactions so you know alcohol benzos opioids any medication that kind of has sedative type properties um, that can contribute to confusion um, and sedation definitely need to, to think about those agents 
um, in combination with a drug like oxybutynin. 3A4 inhibitors, uh, I think I've talked about a lot of those in, in the past. Um, some of the, the macrolides like erythromycin, um, clarithromycin can sometimes increase concentrations um, and the activity of oxybutynin. Not, I would, wouldn't say crazy, crazy um, risky, but there is that potential where we raise concentrations and have the potential to uh, increase adverse effects of oxybutynin. I uh, mentioned metoclopramide, erythromycin being used for gastroparesis. Uh, so definitely think about that, and oxybutynin could definitely uh, counteract or oppose uh, what you're trying to do with some of those uh, pro-kinetic uh, medications for the, the GI tract there and gastroparesis. And then, of course, lastly, I, I definitely want to mention uh, dementia medication. So if you see a patient on uh, your Aricep's, your Nemendas, you've got to remember that oxybutynin can potentially um, cause those medications to be added. I've seen that in clinical practice where a patient uh, starts and oxybutynin is increased for urinary issues. And now all of a sudden, four weeks, six weeks, ten weeks later, oh, yep, you know, they're having some confusion. They're having some memory issues. And now we add on a dementia medication like Aricept or Namenda. And, you know, are we actually having dementia and dementia issues or did oxybutynin cause uh, central nervous system adverse effects and cause those issues ultimately leading to the prescribing cascade and the addition of those dementia medications. So again, same thing. If you see patients already on dementia meds, be extremely careful with a drug like oxybutynin um, because we may worsen that cognition and worsen worsen issues with with patients there. So again, this is you know one of the things that we um, look at with uh, urinary uh, medications like oxybutynin, and there certainly are other urinary anticholinergics that may have may not have as much uh, central nervous system penetration or risk for adverse effects. So uh, again, I'll talk about those in, in future podcasts, uh, but there definitely are um, anticholiner, urinary anticholinergics that have less action on the CNS. So again, need to look at those patients critically, think clinically, um, and uh, make sure we're selecting the best agents uh, for our patients there. All right, well, that's going to wrap up this podcast for today. Uh, thank you so much for listening. Um, if you enjoyed the podcast, found it helpful, leave a rating, review on iTunes or wherever you're listening. Also, go subscribe, reallifepharmacology.com, and of course, support the sponsor, uh, meded101.com slash store, S-T-O-R-E. If you want to track me down, uh, you can email me at mededucation101 at gmail.com. Uh, probably the most active social media profile. Uh, you can find me on LinkedIn, Eric Christensen, PharmD, BCPS, BCGP. Thanks again for listening. Uh, take care and hope you have a great rest of your day.